I was enjoying a peaceful life, content with a stable job that paid well. My world was turned upside down one day when my credit card company called to inform me about a suspicious $50,000 charge on my account. I was utterly taken aback by this news. I acted swiftly to stop the charge, and in the aftermath, my husband, who was then overseas, bombarded me with phone calls. With some effort, we managed to clear up the confusion. My name is Alexis, I'm 27 years old, and I've climbed the career ladder to become a manager. My journey began in college, where I met Paul, my husband, who is of the same age. This year marks our third wedding anniversary. Many of my acquaintances chose to leave their jobs upon getting married, but I had compelling reasons to continue working. Despite societal norms, I am the primary breadwinner in our household, earning more than my husband. This fact is an unspoken element of our marriage, yet it looms large in my mind. I often ponder our financial stability, concerned that relying solely on my husband's earnings might not secure the future we envision. Nonetheless, it's clear he shares these concerns, even if we seldom discuss them directly. In our relationship, financial independence is key. We maintain separate finances, equally splitting household expenses, a system that affords me the freedom to manage my discretionary income as I see fit. This arrangement has fostered a sense of satisfaction and has contributed significantly to our comfortable lifestyle. However, there are moments that prompt me to reconsider our expenses. One such instance occurred while I was reviewing my email notifications on the train home, frowning upon seeing a debit alert. It served as a reminder to reevaluate my ongoing subscriptions, contemplating the necessity of each. Yet, the task of managing these financial obligations often falls by the wayside, complicated by forgotten passwords and the daunting prospect of navigating customer service hotlines. The restricted availability of these services, confined to standard working hours, does little to ease the situation, creating a paradox for working individuals like myself who find it nearly impossible to reach out during these times. Despite these hurdles, I find solace in the small pleasures of life, like online shopping. It serves as a brief escape from the pressures of work, with the arrival of each parcel bringing a fleeting moment of joy. Yet, these moments of happiness are quickly overshadowed by the realization of the need to manage my finances more prudently. The comfort of returning home always brings a sense of relief, a reminder of the stable life we've built together, despite the occasional financial folly. When I walked into the living room, I immediately felt annoyed. Socks were scattered on the floor, empty cans were on the table, and there were a phone and a sweatshirt on the sofa. Yes, this was my husband's doing. He tends to leave a mess everywhere after he gets home. I couldn't help but complain about the socks and cans. He just shrugged it off, saying it was easy to clean up, and I could just do it if I was home early. Why couldn't he help clean or make dinner? He complained about being tired and having to eat convenience store food. I was tired too, but I argued that if he wasn't going to help around the house, he should at least focus on his work. He didn't take my frustration seriously at first, but I could tell he was annoyed when he repeated his dismissal. He left the room, glued to his phone and ignoring my glare. It felt unfair that I was doing more work in housekeeping. Yet, I wondered if I had been too harsh. I worried he might become even more careless just to spite me. Surprisingly, my words seemed to have an effect. He started coming home late, claiming he had overtime work. It seemed like he was trying to change. I was so pleased that I began to put even more effort into the housework, thinking I should support him since he was busy. One day, I came home early and decided to tidy up his room, which he hadn't cleaned in a while. It was a mess, just as I expected, with empty cans and bottles everywhere. I was about to throw them out when I noticed something unusual on the bed, a gift-wrapped package. I couldn't clearly make out what it was at first, so I decided to shine a light on the mysterious object. It turned out to be a bag from my favorite brand, beautifully wrapped and just sitting there, partially hidden. The realization hit me, could this be a surprise birthday present? My birthday was just around the corner, the following week, to be exact. A flicker of excitement passed through me, but I quickly suppressed it, choosing to act as if I hadn't seen the package. I wanted to keep the surprise intact, assuming my husband had planned to give it to me on my special day. 
However, my much-anticipated birthday came and went without any mention of the package. I couldn't help but bring up the subject, half in jest, half in hope, asking my husband if he remembered what day it was. His reaction was one of brief surprise followed by an awkward acknowledgement of my birthday. But when I prodded him about a celebration or a gift, his response was dismissive, almost as if gifting was an obligation fulfilled in the past and not to be bothered with again, especially now that I was old enough. His words stung more than I cared to admit, and he retreated to his room, leaving me in a mix of confusion and disappointment. The situation took an even more peculiar turn when, out of the blue, my husband announced he was scheduled for an overseas business trip the following week. This was unprecedented. His job had never required travel before, let alone an international trip. He attributed this sudden opportunity to his recent good performance at work. Under normal circumstances, I would have been supportive, even happy for him. However, the unexplained birthday gift and his nonchalant dismissal of my birthday had planted seeds of doubt in my mind. On the morning of his supposed departure, I watched him leave, my heart heavy with a mix of emotions. Once he was gone, I couldn't resist the urge to investigate further. I ventured into his room, a place I hadn't stepped into since the day I discovered the hidden gift. My heart raced as I looked under the bed where the gift had been, only to find nothing. The absence of the package confirmed my suspicions. There was more to the story than he was letting on. This wasn't about a business trip. It was something else entirely. Dragging myself to work that day felt like moving through molasses. My thoughts were elsewhere, caught in a loop of doubts, fears, and unspoken questions about my husband's actions and intentions. I struggled to concentrate, my work suffering as a result. My colleagues noticed my distracted state, inquiring if everything was okay. I brushed off their concern with a weak excuse about lack of sleep, not willing to share the turmoil swirling inside me. Amidst this inner chaos, my phone vibrated with an incoming call from an unknown number. Normally, I would ignore such calls, but given the day's earlier revelations and my heightened state of anxiety, I felt compelled to answer. Maybe it was intuition or perhaps desperation for any piece of information that could shed light on the situation. I picked up the phone, my heart pounding in anticipation of what or who awaited on the other end. I had to step out for a bit and press the button to answer my phone in the hallway. It was the credit card company calling. I started worrying it wasn't my husband calling and realized I would have to share my password and other details. I wondered what they wanted, and the person on the phone quickly explained. They were calling because my account showed more than $20,000 spent, actually $50,000. I couldn't believe it and panicked, thinking there was no way that was right. I hurried back to my desk to check my wallet, but it was missing along with the credit card that should have been inside. I got back on the phone and asked if I could stop the transaction. Luckily, it was still pending, so they said I could stop it. I felt a bit better but knew this wasn't the end of it. I told them I didn't have my card and asked them to treat it as if it were stolen. The person agreed to start the process right away. Even after hanging up, my heart wouldn't calm down. I told my boss I was feeling sick, that my credit card might have been stolen and misused, and I needed to leave early to sort things out. My colleagues and boss were concerned and let me go home. Rushing to catch the train, I saw my husband had called me many times, almost as if he had something to do with this mess. I got home, tossed my bag aside, and went straight to my husband's room. I opened his computer to check his search history and saw luxury cruises and travel packages for couples at the top. I wasn't supposed to know about any trip. I checked the destination and realized this was the business trip he mentioned. It was clear it wasn't a business trip at all. I looked through my emails and found it a booking confirmation with the name Mario on it. Who is this woman? I was so angry I nearly broke the keyboard, but I forced myself to look for more proof. My phone kept ringing, driving me crazy. I remembered the password the credit card company gave me, so I logged in to check my spending history. As I looked through it, my shock grew. There was a charge I didn't recognize for a fancy bag. Everything clicked Paul had used my card to buy something for his mistress, Anne, and even took her on what he claimed was a business trip. Frustrated and angry, I finally answered my constantly ringing phone. My husband was on the other end, complaining about the card not working. 
I confronted him about Anne, and he stumbled over his words, claiming he didn't steal the card but borrowed it for convenience on his business trip. I questioned him about the so-called business trip and mentioned the luxury cruise. He tried to dodge the question, but I pressed on about Anne and the bag. He tried to act confused, but I laid out everything I knew the cruise, the couple's travel package, the $50,000 spending, and the payments to Anne using my card. Hearing all this, my husband could only repeat, I understand, as if finally realizing the gravity of the situation. After he admitted to cheating and awkwardly apologized over the phone, pleading for me to reactivate the credit card so he could return home, I felt a mix of anger and disbelief. His assumption that a simple apology would erase his betrayal was absurd. I sharply told him to enjoy his indefinite stay at the resort, effectively ending our relationship with that phone call. Ignoring his attempts to continue the conversation, I hung up. His persistent calls soon followed, each ringtone amplifying my frustration until I decided to block his number, seeking some peace from the incessant buzzing. Knowing his return flight was scheduled for noon in three days, as per the booking confirmation email he never intended for me to see, I sprang into action. These three days would be pivotal. My first task was daunting but necessary. I began the process of removing all my belongings from our shared home, severing the physical ties that bound us. The following day, armed with divorce papers and his computer, which contained undeniable evidence of his infidelity, I visited his parents. The revelation of their son's actions left them both furious and deeply apologetic. Their immediate response was supportive. They assured me of a swift divorce, a generous alimony of $145,000, and reimbursement for the expenses their son had wastefully incurred. As the day of his supposed return arrived, I received confirmation from his parents that the divorce papers were processed. They shared that, apart from the illicit credit card expenditures, he had not taken any money. The other woman, having learned of the entire fiasco, was enraged. In a fit of anger, she changed her ticket to leave for Singapore before him, leaving him stranded. It puzzled me why she hadn't taken more drastic measures, like taking his passport to further complicate his return. When he finally arrived back in Singapore, he was greeted by the stark reality of an empty home and a disconnected phone number mine. In desperation, he sought solace at his parents' house, only to be met with severe reprimand. They insisted he sign the divorce papers, officially ending our marriage. Complicating matters further, the woman now demanded from him a repayment of the $50,000 she presumably felt entitled to, given their affair and its lavish expenditures. His parents, once again, had to cover this amount, but with the stipulation that he repay them in full. Until then, his lifestyle was significantly curtailed, much like that of a strictly supervised teenager, complete with a 9 p.m. curfew. In the aftermath, Armed with the necessary details from his parents, I pursued legal action against the woman for $7,000, seeking some form of restitution for the role she played in this ordeal. With that final act, I concluded this tumultuous chapter of my life, ready to move forward, free from the deceit and betrayal that had ensnared me. The next day, I went back to work. A lot of my coworkers, both my seniors and juniors, showed they cared about me. They asked, Hey, are you okay? I'm here to listen if you need to talk. It made me feel thankful to work with such kind people. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Let's grab a drink sometime, my treat. It'll be like a venting session, I suggested. They agreed, and it felt good to let out everything that happened while we shared some drinks. It was like I was washing away all the bad memories. I ended the night feeling hopeful, thinking that from now on, only good things would come my way. Yes, that's right, I told myself, feeling optimistic about the future. Alexis. Okay then, I'm going on the trip with my mom. You stay here, okay? I was shocked and couldn't say a word. But this is the prize I won in the contest, you know. Also, if the winner doesn't use the ticket, it becomes useless. I wanted to say that, but my husband David cut me off with something shocking. If you don't like it, we can just get a divorce, he said. Excuse me. I mean, if you can't agree with what I'm saying, then we should get a divorce. His words made my feelings for him instantly fade. My name is Olivia, 
and I'm a 32-year-old office worker. I went to an all-girls school from middle school through university and started working without really talking to men. I was so busy with work that I never had time to fall in love. Suddenly, I was 27 and still single. Thinking this was not right, a friend set me up on a blind date. That's how I met my first boyfriend, who was a freelancer but lied about being an office worker. After we started dating, he lost his job and seemed ready to rely on me for everything. I ended things as soon as I could. After that experience, I became even more cautious about men and found it hard to trust them. So I reached 40 without any serious relationships. My parents were even more worried about me than I was. Both my parents had already been married for several years by the time they were my age, so they were quite eager for me to settle down as well. Back then, most people got married by 24, but nowadays it's common to marry later, even in your 40s. My dad started bringing me several arranged marriage proposals, saying he'd find someone for me since I didn't have a boyfriend. At first, I rejected all the offers, but over time, I felt bad for continuously saying no to what my dad suggested. I could tell that my parents, who wanted nothing but happiness for their only daughter, were getting impatient. So, I decided to take a positive step and agreed to go on a blind date to show my appreciation for my parents. That's when I met David, who later became my husband. David was 31, just like me. He had been to an all-boys school and never really had the opportunity to fall in love with a girl before. What I liked about him was how caring he was towards his parents. He looked after them well, often visited their home, and took them on trips. He appeared to have a good character and a stable job at a company. I checked his business card to be sure. Having learned from a past mistake with a previous boyfriend, I was very cautious. However, everything seemed normal with David, and I felt he was trustworthy. As we dated David, knowing I was shy, took the initiative and treated me very well. I gradually found myself more drawn to him. After three years of dating, David proposed, and we got married. My parents were overjoyed and shed tears of happiness when they heard the news that I was finally getting married. I genuinely felt fortunate to have met a good man and was equally pleased about looking after my parents in this significant way. After our wedding, my husband and I enjoyed our honeymoon and began our married life with joy and companionship. We both had jobs, so we shared the household duties accordingly. Cooking was my fort as my husband wasn't great at it, so he took on the laundry and cleaning tasks. We worked well together, supporting each other and enjoying a harmonious married life. However, our marital bliss faced challenges after just a year. The turning point came when my father-in-law died from an illness. This event deeply affected my husband, who then started paying excessive attention to my mother-in-law, Julie, who was left alone. David, my husband, began spending his days off at his mother's house. Sometimes, he and Julie would go out just the two of them, and occasionally, he would stop by her place after work to share a meal. They even started taking trips together. This situation made me feel deeply disrespected. It wasn't just about him caring for his mother, which I understood and respected, but the secrecy and the priority he gave her over our relationship hurt me. It seemed he had shifted from being family-oriented to becoming overly attached to his mother, a true mama's boy. Despite this, David appeared oblivious to the implications of his actions or how they affected our marriage. In an effort to maintain peace and hoping for a change, I decided to compromise and continue investing in our relationship. The idea of divorcing after only a year of marriage was upsetting, particularly considering how it would affect my parents. Moreover, I harbored hopes that starting a family might bring a new dynamic to our relationship, potentially shifting David's focus. The decision to not rush into a divorce was difficult, but I resolved to stick it out pondering on the complexities of our relationship and the potential for change. I recently started a new hobby of entering contests to win prizes, which I found surprisingly enjoyable. 
I've been winning things like cosmetics and food by writing reviews and staying persistent. Then I won a big prize in one contest airline tickets to Fiji. I was so surprised that I read the email three times. I carefully checked to make sure it wasn't a scam. It didn't lead me to any strange websites or ask for my credit card information, so it was indeed a real win. I learned that I needed to contact the airline in advance to use the tickets. I wondered who to take with me. My husband had just gone to New Hampshire with Julie. I thought about asking my friends or my parents. Eventually, I decided to give the tickets to my parents so they could enjoy the trip. I went to my parents' house to tell him about it. It's been years since we traveled abroad. Are you sure about this? My dad asked. You won this, Olivia. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I want to treat you guys this time, I said. They were happy, but then my dad noticed something in the ticket's conditions. This ticket is only valid for the person who won it and can't be transferred or sold, he read. What? Does that mean I can't give it to you both? I asked. Yeah, it seems so, he replied. Oh well, it can't be helped, my mom said. You want it, honey, so why don't you go with David? Since my parents suggested it, I decided to go with my husband. When I returned home from my parents' house that night, I found a woman's coat by the front door. It looked familiar, yes, it was Julie's coat. When I entered the living room, I saw Julie watching TV. Oh, Olivia, did you just get home? It's your day off, so what kept you out so late? She asked. Oh, I didn't know you were here, Julie. I replied. What are you implying? Is it wrong for me to visit my son's house? She said. No, it's not, I answered. Julie seemed nicer to me when my father-in-law was still alive. Since he passed, she has been very strict and cold towards me. What's this? What did you buy? Julie noticed the bag I was carrying. It's nothing, I said. Just show it to me, she demanded. Why? I asked. Just show it, she insisted, and then she snatched the bag from me. Fiji, are you just treating yourself? What are you doing with David's money? What are you talking about? I've never depended on David's money, I said. I won a pair of travel tickets in a contest, so I thought I would go on the trip with my husband. Oh, really? A prize, huh? Julie's mood suddenly changed, and she got excited. I had a bad feeling about this. Then my husband came into the living room, fresh from a bath. Oh, Olivia, welcome back. What's wrong? He asked, hearing his mother's excited voice from the bath. David, listen, Olivia won a trip to Fiji in a contest. Julie told him. Wow, that's great, he said. Yeah, I added, so I decided I'd go with you, David. I even bought a guidebook for it. How many people can go on that trip? He asked. It's just two tickets, so it would be just us, I replied. David was silent for a moment, glancing at Julie. She was looking at him with wide eyes, like a dog hoping to be fed. Okay, well then, I'm going to go on the trip with my mom. You stayed home, okay? He said. I was completely speechless. I couldn't believe David was so attached to his mom. This is what I won from the contest, you know, I reminded him. So what? We're a couple, so what's yours is mine, right? And what's mine is my mom's, he replied. What kind of logic is that? I thought, no way. Besides, you and Julie just went on a trip a few weeks ago. That trip doesn't relate to this one. I paid for that and it was within the country, he argued. I haven't been on an overseas trip in years. I'm so excited, Julie chimed in, already planning the trip. Hey, I didn't even agree that you two would be the ones going. Besides, the ticket would be invalid if I'm not there, I tried to say, but David cut me off with something shocking. If you don't like it, then we can just get a divorce, he said. Excuse me, I said, if you can't listen and follow what I say, then we'll get a divorce. I never thought he would say something like that. Instantly, my affection for him cooled. Do whatever you want, I told him. Why didn't you just say you were so selfish? Both David and Julie looked as if they had won a big fight.
They took the guidebook for me and began to happily plan their trip. Meanwhile, I started thinking about what I would do after a divorce. Later, my husband asked me to contact the airline, so I did. I asked if I could give the tickets to my husband or relatives if I couldn't go. Sorry, but you're not allowed to give the tickets away, even to your family or relatives, the operator replied. Well, of course, I said, realizing this made sense. I then decided to decline the tickets I had won in the contest and hung up the phone. Afterwards, I told my husband about my decision. I called to remind you about the terms and conditions on the tickets, so please check the details. Then my husband scoffed and said, I don't need to read the terms and conditions, and left the tickets on the shelf. He probably never thought those tickets could be invalid. I told my parents about this incident. I asked them for help because I planned to move out on the day David and Julie went on their trip. My father was shocked when he heard what happened. He had suggested the arranged marriage with David, so he felt responsible. It's not your fault, Dad. He only recently started showing his true colors. I reassured him, trying to make him feel better. On the day of the trip, David was in a great mood and getting ready to leave. Well, I'm off then. Take care of the house while I'm gone, he said with a big grin. Yeah, have fun, I replied with a big smile, surprising him. As soon as he left, my parents arrived to help me move. They loaded my belongings into the car, and we drove to the new apartment I had found near my office. I had started looking for a new place as soon as I got fed up with my husband. Five hours later, my husband called me. Hello. Hey, what's going on? They said our airline tickets are invalid. Yes, that's correct. If the winner doesn't go, the tickets are invalid. I didn't hear anything about that. I told you, didn't I? I told you to check the terms and conditions. It's all written right there. You've got to be kidding me. I wouldn't even read that. Well, that's your fault for not reading it. It's like someone who gets sued and says they didn't know anything about the law. What am I supposed to do now? I already got a hotel in Fiji. They told me I'd have to pay for our own ticket fees. Like I said, it's none of my business anymore. You and Julie should just take care of it. I said that and hung up the phone. Twenty minutes later, my husband called again. What now? Hey, why can't I pay with your card? Huh? My card? What do you mean? I panicked and checked the drawers, only to find that my card, which I had been using as a backup, was gone. You took the card without my permission. I was only borrowing it for a little while, but I was told by the airline staff that I can't use this card. What the hell is going on? Are you stupid? If you're not the owner of the card, you can't use it. That's, but on the internet? Huh, internet? Oh, oh no, and he hung up the phone. No way, I immediately checked my credit card statement for the card I used as a backup and saw charges I didn't recognize. I remembered my husband had been buying a lot of clothes and other things recently. He must have used my card without my permission. I quickly blocked the card and took a screenshot of the statement history. With this evidence, I planned to confront him later. A few days after his trip to Fiji, my husband called. Hey, what is the meaning of this? I don't see any of your stuff and belongings in our house anymore. And you left divorce papers on the table. What the hell are you thinking? Well, I mean, I can't go on living with a mama's boy who prioritizes his mother over his wife and turns into a thief using my credit card without permission. What? If you won't sign the divorce papers, then let's fight in court. Court? Oh, are you in trouble? If people at work find out about this. I see. Then I'll request my divorce through my lawyer, so you better quietly agree to the request. No way. My husband reluctantly agreed to the divorce. He accepted on the condition that there would be no division of property, and he would also pay for the credit card bills he racked up without my permission but my revenge doesn't end there. I decided not to talk about what had happened, but I wasn't sure what my father, who had arranged the marriage, would do or say. Soon my ex-husband called me. Hey, this is not what we agreed on. 
Everyone at work knows about what happened. Now, they talk about me behind my back, and I'm known as a mama's boy and a thief. I can't hold my head high in my company anymore. Oh, what a pity, I replied, but I hadn't told anyone about this. Did you forget that so many people were involved in our marriage? He asked. Yes, our marriage was arranged through connections. My father, a general manager, and my ex-husband's boss, a department head, were good friends. They set up our blind date because my ex-husband was a promising bachelor working under him. It turned out that my ex-husband's boss was very upset with him over this whole mess. David was now being shunned at work, and his career prospects had dimmed. As for Julie, the news had spread to her neighbors, and they started avoiding her, leading her to isolate herself at home. They both faced the consequences of their actions, and I felt no sympathy for them. Meanwhile, I focused on my career, earned a promotion, and received a raise. To celebrate, I took my parents on an overseas trip to France, a place we had all wanted to visit for a long time. We created wonderful memories together. This whole ordeal has been a learning experience for me. I'm shocked that he turned out to be not just overly attached to his mom, but also a thief. At this point, there's nothing more to be done for him. I'm relieved that my family enjoyed their time together in France. I hope I, a kind and family-oriented person, will find someone better and truly wonderful in the future. Thank you for watching until the end. Please subscribe to our channel, and we hope to see you in our next video. From this point forward, we're going to take charge of the house ourselves. You'll need to look for a new place to live. My brother and his wife, with my mother's backing, are insisting I leave, viewing me as a hindrance. It's bewildering that they overlook the fact I've been footing the bill for our living expenses. Their lack of appreciation and respect astounds me. In response, I've resolved to take matters into my own hands. My name is Helen, and I'm a 35-year-old woman who moved back in with my parents after college. Venturing out into the world proved more challenging than expected. Initially, I looked for jobs while receiving unemployment benefits. Then, I discovered the world of remote work and carved out a niche for myself as a freelance engineer, leveraging my background in science. Starting with smaller tasks, I managed to earn a modest income, but more importantly, I gathered invaluable experience. Working from home not only suited me financially, but also helped me avoid overwhelming social interactions, boosting my self-esteem. Gradually, I took on bigger projects, and my earnings increased to match those of a typical corporate employee. However, my parents, particularly my mother who holds traditional views, struggled to comprehend my unconventional work arrangement. Despite my efforts to explain, my mother remained skeptical, fearing what she couldn't understand. My father seemed to get it, but my mother couldn't shake her concerns, often questioning the sustainability of my job. She couldn't grasp the concept, no matter how much I tried to reassure her of my professional commitment. She would express concerns about me staying home too long, mistaking my career choice for a mere phase or a consequence of mental health issues, despite it having been over three years. Her inability to understand extended to questioning the legitimacy of my online work, even suggesting that it might be something illicit or tied to peculiar beliefs. Despite showing her emails from clients and my income statements, she remained unconvinced, failing to recognize the legitimacy and potential of my career path. This misunderstanding and lack of support within my family have led to a pivotal moment where I must assert my independence and navigate my own way forward. I shared with my mom how I receive consistent payments from my job, trying to assure her of its reliability but she remained unconvinced, plagued by worries that I might be living off unemployment benefits. The thought of moving out on my own had crossed my mind, yet I hadn't managed to save enough money for such a step. Around the same time, my dad's health took a turn for the worse, requiring nursing care after an early retirement that led to a decrease in our family's income. When I voiced my concerns, he comforted me, 
saying, Oh Helen, I have my pension. We'll manage. Given my mother's tendency to overspend, I couldn't help but question, are you sure we can make ends meet? Nonetheless, we had to make do with what we had, our savings. Seeing my dad weary, possibly anxious about what lay ahead, weighed on me. He had always been there for me, supporting me through college and my return home due to mental health challenges. Leaving him in such a situation seemed unthinkable. My mom, too, was taken aback by my dad's sudden health issues. Wanting to give back and support my family, I decided to stay. Don't worry, Dad. I've got this, I assured him. His surprised response, really? But can you really afford to? Pushed me to show him my bank account details, proving my financial stability. Dad, I didn't realize you were doing so well, he admitted upon seeing my earnings. Could you help out then? Of course, I replied. You've supported me through so much, it's my turn to support us. This pledge led me to take on the household's financial responsibilities, covering everything from my father's medical expenses to daily living costs. I began transferring a set amount monthly to help with our expenses, and I created a new main credit card for my mom, adding her as an additional user since she previously relied on my dad's card. Both my dad and I tried to save as much as we could, encouraging my mom to do the same. Despite my efforts, my mom remained skeptical of my contribution and even suggested I should move out. My dad, recognizing the significance of my financial support, argued that without me, they'd face even greater difficulties. Reluctantly, my mom agreed to let me stay. While I continued my work and contributed at home, my mom took my help for granted and imposed stricter demands. Can't you finish your chores faster? She would ask. Sorry, it's tough managing work and household tasks, I replied. She often doubted the difficulty of balancing both, leading to a growing strain in our relationship. My dad, however, understood and appreciated my contributions. We managed to maintain this arrangement for a year until, unfortunately, my dad's health declined further, requiring hospitalization. Every day, I made sure to visit my dad in the hospital. Hey dad, how are you feeling today? I'd ask, thank you, Helen. I'm not seeing much improvement, but I'm more concerned about how this is affecting you, he'd respond. I reassured him, don't worry about me. Looking after you is not a burden, but I've noticed things with mom have been tense since you've been hospitalized. Living with my mom had become increasingly difficult, almost suffocating, yet my desire to support both of my parents never waned. I fondly remembered the days when she would carefully prepare my lunches and dinners during my school years. However, my feelings began to shift when my brother James and his wife Sarah showed up unannounced one day, apparently invited by my mom without my knowledge. James made it clear, we're going to be staying here now. I was taken aback and questioned the sudden decision. He explained, mom's worried about you managing on your own while dad's in the hospital. I looked to my mom for answers, but she avoided my gaze. James tried to reassure me, we're here to support you, Helen. However, Sarah's smirk hinted at an underlying tension. My mom then added, thank you both. Helen, you'll need to pull your weight, or living here could become difficult for you. Their sudden presence in our home marked the beginning of a challenging new chapter. Despite my brother's successful career and presumed financial stability, the dynamics at home became strained. My sister-in-law's demands, such as waking me up early to make breakfast, clash with my work schedule. As someone who thrives in the early hours, these interruptions were particularly frustrating. I'm already working, I protest, but she insisted. Then hurry up and get breakfast ready. Must I do everything myself? Our family mornings used to be laid back, with each of us eating whenever and whatever we preferred. I had assumed that, with my mother and sister-in-law at home, preparing breakfast would naturally fall to them. Yet my sister-in-law believed in shared responsibilities, pushing me to contribute. Reluctantly, I helped with breakfast, but my efforts seemed never to satisfy them. 
I had prepared a thoughtful meal of soft scrambled eggs, a lettuce salad, buttered toast, and a juicy sausage a perfectly respectable breakfast, I believed. But their expectations were evidently much higher, adding to the growing tension within our household. Feeling a mix of frustration and disbelief, I responded to their complaints about breakfast. If you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. They were visibly taken aback by my reaction. What kind of attitude is that? Who do you think you are? It's not right for you not to help out more around the house, they criticized. But I also have work, I tried to explain, only to be met with skepticism. Work? Really? What kind of work do you call that? It sounds ridiculous, my brother and his wife rebuked, their words sharp and dismissive. Influenced by my mother, my brother had always had a tendency to belittle me and my efforts. Despite their attitudes, I knew the value of my work time. Without another word, I gathered my belongings, including my laptop, and left the house, ignoring my brother's calls after me. I headed directly to my dad's hospital room. Upon seeing my rushed entrance, he asked, Helen, what's wrong? You look upset. After I shared what happened, he was taken aback. I had no idea things had gotten that bad at home. I'm sorry, Helen. Remember, you can choose your own path in life. Feeling somewhat adrift, I reflected on how my mother seemed to prefer James's presence at home. My dad offered comforting words, you don't have to stay in a place where you feel unwelcome. I want you to be happy. Live your life the way you see fit. His words bolstered my resolve to find a new living situation. Returning home that evening, I walked into a stern atmosphere. My mother, brother, and sister-in-law awaited with serious expressions. Where have you been all day? My brother demanded. I thought you were at work. I took the day off because of you, he claimed, which surprised me. Taking a day off so abruptly seemed quite irresponsible to me. As the confrontation escalated, my brother and his wife made their stance clear. Get out, my brother stated. Why? I asked, confused. From now on, the two of us will live here. If you're not willing to fit in, you should leave. We don't need your help, they insisted, attempting to push me out of my own home. That's enough, Helen. You don't need to be here, especially now that your father isn't at home, my mother added, siding with them. It seemed they all viewed me more as a nuisance than a contributing member of the family. Did my mother not realize the extent of my financial contributions? even as she indulged in her monthly splurges on luxury items. I wondered how she would manage once her allowance for me stopped. Their disregard for my contributions and their decision to oust me from the house made it clear that it was time for me to carve out my own space, away from the familial tension and misunderstandings. My frustration reached its peak. Despite numerous attempts to explain my situation, my mother, brother and sister-in-law continued to disregard my contributions. Pushed to my limits, I decided it was time for a strategic move, a sort of wake-up call for them. I discreetly transferred the funds from the bank account tied to my mother's credit card into another account under my control, curious to see her reaction when she found her card declined. Likewise, I reallocated some money from my father's account which had been essential in supporting our household expenses. From then on, only his medical costs would be taken from this particular account, a detail my mother was not aware of. This shift placed a newfound financial pressure on my brother and his wife, challenging them to shoulder the burden I had Helen for so long. After setting my plan into motion, I packed up my life and announced, I'm leaving this place. Their faces registered surprise at my declaration. Despite their continuous negative treatment, they hadn't expected me to actually make such a decisive move. However, their smirks seemed to suggest they found some pleasure in my departure. You're finally leaving. There was never anyone as bothersome as you, they taunted, confident I wouldn't return. Of course, I won't. And don't bother contacting me, I retorted. As I walked away, they were still smiling, but I wondered how long their amusement would last once reality set in. 
In my new sanctuary, I found peace and the space to fully dedicate myself to my work. Then, unexpectedly, my brother reached out, his voice laced with surprise and a hint of desperation. I thought I made it clear not to contact me. What's the matter? I asked, not hiding my annoyance. Oh that, well, we didn't know. Why didn't you tell us? He stumbled over his words. I tried, remember? But my work and contributions were always dismissed, I reminded him. He tried to shift blame, well, mom said, and I guess I got confused. That's not really my fault, is it? No, it's not. But now you're experiencing the financial strain. Mom's spending habits, coupled with the unpaid bills, it's all on you now. Managing all that was part of how I supported the household. Now that I'm gone, you'll need to figure it out, I explained calmly. The reality of their new financial responsibilities was a stark wake-up call for my brother. Without me to rely on, they were forced to confront the consequences of their actions and attitudes. This move wasn't about revenge, it was about asserting my worth and the value of my contributions, teaching them a lesson in respect and responsibility as I embarked on a path to personal and professional fulfillment. I was taken aback when my brother reached out for financial help. I need you to transfer some money into my bank account, he pleaded urgently. I couldn't help but express my disbelief, are you serious? You work for a large company, shouldn't that be enough? That's when he dropped the bombshell. Actually, I was let go from the job because of a major mistake I made. This revelation left me speechless. It seemed my brother had returned to our parents' home under the assumption that it was financially secure, partly due to my father's retirement pension. I had long wanted to make it clear to him the critical role I played in keeping our family afloat financially. The thought of his surprise upon realizing that it was actually me who had been managing the household's finances, assuming they were stable, was ironically amusing. This surprise would soon extend to his wife and our mother as well. Soon after, my brother's wife joined the plea, we really need your help, our savings are running out. My mother chimed in with, your father is upset and won't be contributing to the household finances anymore. We're in a bind but I had reached my limit. I've supported you all more than enough. You're all capable of working, so it's time to support yourselves. I'll be cheering you on from afar, I responded, a mix of determination and resignation in my voice. A plea for reconsideration came through the phone, but I stood firm, distancing myself from my brother, his wife, and my mother. My father, too, found it difficult to go back to living with my mother, opting instead for legal advice and a new living arrangement. Thankfully, this allowed me to visit him daily, maintaining our bond. A friend filled me in on my family's current situation. My brother had downsized to a modest apartment, adopting a more frugal lifestyle. My mother, traditionally a homemaker, found adjusting to employment challenging. While my brother struggled to accept the perspectives of younger colleagues in his new part-time role, leading to short-lived employment. His wife became the Prisara breadwinner, working tirelessly until the burden became too great, prompting her departure. Now, reports suggest my brother and mother are working hard to make ends meet, though my mother's penchant for overspending continues, leading to accumulating debts. While I worry about their well-being, the distance I've put between us is a reminder of the boundaries I had to set for my own peace of mind and financial security. I've reached a point where providing further financial help isn't possible for me. Right now, I'm dedicating a lot of energy toward creating a comfortable life for myself. My income has been slowly rising, and I'm thinking about exploring new opportunities. One of my biggest goals is to visit my dad every day. I want to spend quality time with him and see his joyful smile more often. My name is James Franco, and I'm just an ordinary office worker. My life is pretty boring, just going back and forth between work and home every day with nothing special to talk about. When I first started working, I dreamed of climbing the corporate ladder, but I'm not good at making calculated moves because of my personality. I often end up with jobs that nobody else wants to do. My inability to say no is my own enemy. Even though I work hard, 
I'm still a regular employee with no title to my name. However, there was a time when I used to be a lot happier and smiled more. I married my girlfriend, whom I had been dating since the start of my working life. We had a happy marriage, which motivated me to do well at my job. But that happy life didn't last long. Are you telling me to live on this meager amount this month again? A few years into our marriage, my inability to succeed at work frustrated my wife, and she often showed her irritation. I'm sorry, I do my best, I would say. How many years and how many times have you repeated those words? I thought marrying you would mean a better life, but with this low salary, we can't do anything. I'm fed up. My wife Rachel has always loved spending money on herself, from beauty treatments and cosmetics to nails, hair salons and clothes. She was happiest when keeping herself beautiful. It seems she married me believing that life would be luxurious since I am a doctor's son. Indeed, my dad is a doctor and owns his own clinic. But my dad, who had a personality similar to mine, often saw his patients for almost charitable rates. He often provided care without profit for patients who were hesitant to seek treatment due to financial constraints. People can pay back when they recall it in the future as long as they are alive to do so. Money can't be made if you're not alive, my dad used to say. Because of this, despite being a doctor's family, we never lived a wealthy life. Of course, as a child, I never felt unhappy or questioned our way of living. I'm still proud of my dad to this day. However, Rachel decided to marry me because she thought being a doctor's son meant wealth without knowing the real story. So our life turned out very different from what she had planned. A few years later, Rachel said, I've had enough. If this is all we can do, there's no point in being with you. Let's get a divorce. A divorce? Hold on, please. I pleaded. How many years do you think I've waited? I age just as much as you do. I need to redo my life while I still can. I definitely don't want to be a low-income wife like you for the rest of my life. With those harsh words, Rachel left, leaving only the divorce papers behind. I was mad at myself for not realizing Rachel's true nature and for not being able to prove her wrong with my job performance. Six years have passed since then. I threw myself into work to heal the emotional wounds, but being not savvy, I still couldn't achieve outstanding performance at work, remaining a regular employee. If this continues, what Rachel said would turn out to be true. I feel utterly miserable. During that time, an envelope arrived in my mailbox. It was from Rachel. What does she want now? I wondered. Inside the letter from my ex-wife, who I hadn't heard from in a long time, was a wedding invitation. It seems Rachel is remarrying someone else. Why would my ex-wife send me an invitation? I thought. As I looked at the postcard, puzzled, I noticed a familiar chapel name written on it. This place, isn't it a super luxurious hotel? Knowing Rachel, she must have chosen a rich man to be her partner this time as well. I could easily guess that she intended to flaunt her happiness in a luxurious hotel wedding just to show the difference between her life now and the life she had with me. I don't owe her to attend. I mean, I was the one who got dumped, but maybe for Rachel too, me not succeeding in my job was an unexpected turn of events. After pondering for a while, I sighed deeply and stood up from my seat. This is the last time. I guess I'll just go. I knew attending the wedding would hurt my pride, but I decided to go anyway. Despite everything, Rachel stayed with me for several years. I can somewhat understand her desire to show me that she's finally happy as a form of revenge. From an outsider's perspective, she might seem too kind-hearted. On the day of the wedding, the weather was perfect. I arrived a bit earlier than planned and, while sipping my coffee in the lounge, stared blankly out the window. It was her second wedding, so I recognized a few of Rachel's friends who I had met before. Unexpectedly, I overheard a conversation from the seat next to me. Rachel did an amazing job to get this wedding, didn't she? One person said. Yeah, it's in a luxury hotel this time. It's a level up from the first one, another replied. She used to complain that her first husband was a doctor's son, but when she found out he was just an ordinary office worker without money, it was really unexpected, wasn't it? Hearing them talk without realizing I was there, I felt a sharp pain in my heart. So Rachel never really liked me for who I was. I realized that when we got divorced, but hearing it from someone else made it even harder. Before she divorced her first husband, she had already set her sights on her current husband. They continued. 
Really well done, Rachel. Well calculated. I couldn't believe my ears. So, Rachel was already in a relationship with her current partner before she even divorced me. My pride was shattered to pieces. She looked down on me so much, but she was the one cheating. I started to regret even being there. Trying to maintain my composure, I took another sip of my coffee, but my hand was shaking. Rachel appeared in front of me, all prepared to move to the bridal room. You really came. You're really a good person, right? She said, sneering at me. Trying to hold back my anger, I responded, Well, consider it my last duty. Glad you could find happiness. I forced a smile. Not liking my attitude, Rachel continued to belittle me. Isn't it wonderful? It's incomparable to the time with you. Here's a share of happiness for the poor bachelor. Be grateful, will you? She laughed sarcastically. Just then, a refreshing-looking man spoke to her from behind. It was the groom, her new husband. Rachel, it seems like the relatives have gathered. Let's hurry to the bridal room. Her husband Scott glanced at me briefly and gave a slight nod. I nodded back reflexively. Perhaps the groom didn't know Rachel had invited her ex-husband to the wedding. There's still some time before the ceremony, so please make yourself comfortable, Scott said with a pleasant smile as they were about to pass by me. At that moment an older man following the groom spoke to me. Excuse me for asking, but may I have your name? Dad, what's wrong? Scott asked. Ah, uh, nothing, just curious, the older man replied. Feeling uneasy under the groom's dad's serious gaze, I responded, My name is James Franco. Franco? Is your father a doctor by any chance? The groom's dad suddenly seemed frantic. Staggering a bit under his intense presence, I nodded. Immediately, the color drained from his face, and he raised his voice. Scott, the wedding is off right now. What? What are you talking about, dad? Scott exclaimed. Caught off guard by this unexpected turn of events, I hurriedly stood up from my seat. No, I didn't do anything, I said, still in a state of panic. The groom's dad began to prostrate himself at my feet. People around the venue started to murmur and stir. Dad, what are you doing? No, really, what? Scott urged his dad to lift his head, but he stayed bowed down, pressing his forehead to the floor. I was completely lost and had no idea what was going on. Rachel, caught in this embarrassing situation, turned red with anger and started to lash out. Can we just talk about this? Lift your head, please, I said, trying to calm the situation. I persuaded the groom's dad to lift his head, and he began to plead for forgiveness, tears in his eyes. I'm begging for your forgiveness. I've been unfaithful to Dr. Franco, he said. It seemed that the groom's dad, Gary, had some past connection with my dad. To understand the truth, I listened intently to Gary's words as he began to speak hesitantly. Gary was a fellow doctor like my dad. The story dates back to my early childhood when Gary was still a trainee doctor at the hospital where my dad had just started his own medical practice. My dad was known for his skills at a well-known university hospital. Gary, who was a student at the Associated Medical School, looked up to him. He volunteered to train at my dad's hospital and learn various techniques. One day, Gary's wife gave birth, but the baby was found to have a serious heart defect. The heart surgery needed was risky and the chances of survival were slim, which made the other doctors hesitant to perform the operation. Desperate, Gary consulted my dad. My dad agreed to help and successfully performed the heart surgery, saving the baby's life. However, the medical expenses for the baby's condition were very high. Gary, being a trainee doctor at the time, couldn't afford to pay it all at once. With tears streaming down his face, he bowed deeply and asked my dad if he could repay the amount in installments. My dad just laughed and shook his head. Someday, when you become a great doctor and have the time to remember me, come back and repay me then. I guarantee you'll definitely become a great doctor, he said, to keep Gary from feeling too pressured. Sometime after, Gary was sent abroad to study medicine and didn't return to the States for several years. Despite this, he never forgot his promise to my dad and continued to save money for the repayment. However, by the time he came back to the States, my dad's hospital was no longer there. The contact information had changed and they had lost touch. Not being able to repay the money had always weighed heavily on his heart and he had lived all those years without being able to do anything about it. Today, he happened to see me at the hotel and was shocked. 
He said I looked just like my dad used to. I'm truly sorry. Please, I'm begging you, let me meet your dad in person and apologize to him, he said, feeling Gary's intense emotions. I responded calmly, that sounds just like my dad, but he passed away five years ago from cancer. Hearing the news, Gary stood there in a daze. No way, he whispered, shocked. Yes, I said softly, he passed away just like that. Until then, he had been moving from one clinic to another. He was a wonderful doctor always considering his patients until the very end. Kneeling on the floor, Gary broke down in tears. Dad, this isn't the place, Scott said, trying to calm his father. That scar on your chest, that's proof that Dr. Franco saved your life. Scott seemed to lose his words. He looked at me, then back at his father, confused and emotional. You're able to have a wedding ceremony and be here today all thanks to Dr. Franco, Gary said, his voice shaking. He bowed to me again. I want to repay all the kindness I couldn't repay to your dad. Please, let me do something. I quickly lifted Gary's face and extended my hand to help him stand up. Mr. Gary, I'm really happy. Just remembering my dad is enough for me. The life my dad saved is now able to celebrate such a wonderful day like today. Being able to see the proof of my dad's existence makes me happy. I'm sure my dad would be happy too. Hearing my words, Gary started crying out loud again. The onlookers began to cheer and applaud, moved by the emotional scene. Rachel was the only one glaring at me with a look of fury. As the time for the ceremony drew near, I stood to the side, watching the event unfold. I couldn't help but reflect on the day's surprising turn of events. Scott and Rachel continued with their preparations, but there was a noticeable tension in the air. Gary stayed close to me, his eyes red from crying. I'm so sorry for everything. Your dad was a great man, and I failed him by not finding him sooner, he said, his voice still shaking. Mr. Gary, I said, placing a hand on his shoulder, you didn't fail him. My dad helped you because he believed in kindness and compassion. He wouldn't want you to feel this way. Just knowing that you remember him and are grateful is enough. Gary nodded, trying to compose himself. Your dad's legacy lives on in you, he said, attempting a smile. He would be proud. The ceremony began, and I found a quiet corner to observe from. Rachel and Scott exchanged their vows, but I couldn't shake the feeling of disconnection from the event. My mind was flooded with memories of my dad, his dedication, and the values he instilled in me. As the ceremony concluded, guests mingled and congratulated the newlyweds. Gary approached me once more. James, if there's anything I can ever do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Your father saved my son, and I owe him everything. I smiled warmly, thank you, Mr. Gary. Just keep living with the same kindness my dad showed you. That's the best way to honor him. Rachel approached, her expression still cold. Enjoying the show, she asked sarcastically. I took a deep breath, Rachel, I didn't come here to cause trouble. I came to pay my respects and to wish you well. She scoffed, well, mission accomplished, now you can leave. I nodded, understanding her anger but feeling no need to respond further. As I turned to go, Scott stepped forward, extending his hand. Thank you for coming, James. It means a lot. I shook his hand. I wish you both the best. Take care of each other. Walking away from the venue, I felt a mix of emotions. The day had brought closure to some old wounds and opened my eyes to the enduring impact of my dad's kindness. It wasn't the outcome I expected but it was a powerful reminder of the values that truly matter. I had an unexpected experience that changed my wounded heart into feelings of pride and happiness. Afterwards, Gary insisted on repaying the medical expenses and the kindness my dad had shown. He gave me a substantial amount of money that he had saved for my dad. Additionally, Gary's hospital started doing business with my company. This significantly boosted my performance at work, and I finally got promoted. The kindness and compassion my dad had shown came back to me in a wonderful way. I cherished this happiness while remembering the serious look in my dad's eyes when he was working. My dad's dedication to helping others had a lasting impact on me and on those he helped. His legacy was not only in the lives he saved but also in the values he instilled in me. As for Rachel, her second marriage didn't turn out as she had hoped. Her husband eventually found out that she had dated me before our divorce and that her motivations for both her previous and current marriages were driven by money. 
Over time, he grew tired of her behavior, and this led to another divorce. I heard about it through the grapevine. It was a reminder that what goes around comes around. Living by my dad's example, I believe that even if something doesn't benefit me directly, it can still bring happiness to someone else. This belief guides my actions every day. Today, I saw someone smile, and just knowing I contributed to that happiness reassures me that my life is heading in the right direction. Reflecting on these events, I realized how much my dad's principles had influenced my life. His approach to helping others without expecting anything in return had come full circle. The money Gary gave me was a tangible reminder of my dad's generosity, but even more valuable was the recognition and respect his actions had earned. At work, my newfound success wasn't just about the promotion. It was about knowing that my dad's legacy had indirectly contributed to my achievements. Gary's hospital partnering with my company was more than a business deal. It was a testament to the long-lasting effects of kindness and integrity. Rachel's situation served as a contrasting lesson. Her focus on material gain led to temporary happiness, but ultimately resulted in loneliness and loss. It was a stark reminder that true happiness and fulfillment come from genuine connections and helping others, not from selfish pursuits. Every day, I strive to live by the values my dad taught me. I take pride in helping others, knowing that even small acts of kindness can have a profound impact. Seeing the smiles of those I help is more rewarding than any material gain. It reassures me that I am on the right path, one that my dad would be proud of. My journey from a wounded heart to a place of pride and happiness has been shaped by the lessons my dad imparted. His life was a beacon of compassion and selflessness, and I aim to follow in his footsteps. The unexpected twists and turns have only reinforced my belief in the power of kindness. As I move forward, I carry with me the memories of my dad's dedication and the impact he had on others. His legacy lives on not just in me but in everyone who experienced his kindness. Each day is an opportunity to honor his memory by continuing to spread happiness and support to those around me. In conclusion, the experience with Gary and the changes in my life have shown me the importance of living with integrity and compassion. My dad's influence continues to guide me and I am committed to making a positive difference in the world, one act of kindness at a time. In a situation that caught me completely off guard, it turned out there wasn't a spot reserved for me during a family trip I was hesitant about from the start. This journey was meant to take us to a luxurious hotel, a setting I was not eagerly anticipating. My husband, Henry, seemed to ignore the obvious tension directed towards me and chose to walk away, promising we'd reconnect at the hotel's checkout. Left alone, I watched as they vanished into the opulence of the hotel. My name is Olivia and this year marked my 32th birthday. I'm a stay-at-home mom, sharing my life with Henry, my mother-in-law Sophia, and my five-year-old son, Jack. Henry and I first crossed paths on a blind date five years back, leading us to tie the knot and enjoy what appeared to be a loving and dispute-free life, at least in the eyes of our neighbors. Our bliss was further solidified four years into our marriage with the birth of our son, Jack. Despite his busy schedule, Henry was a hands-on dad, contributing significantly to childcare, leaving me with no real grievances. Our household dynamics took a hit about three months ago following the death of my father-in-law, necessitating Sophia's move into our home. It had been ages since I last saw her, with our only encounters being at our wedding and a visit to announce our engagement. Unfortunately, my initial impressions of Sophia were far from favorable in stark contrast to the warmth and kindness shown by my father-in-law. Sophia's skepticism about my suitability as Henry's wife was palpable, questioning his choice in me and predicting a future filled with challenges. Despite Henry's efforts to win her over, her disapproving gaze lingered. Eventually, she conceded, influenced by her husband and Henry, though her upfront criticisms in my presence were hard to forget and remain a point of contention to this day. Feeling a bit anxious about how things would pan out, I decided to adopt a positive attitude and do my best to get along with Sophia once she moved in with us. When she arrived, along with her things, I jumped in to help with the unpacking. Sophia was surprisingly sweet with Jack, who had just turned five, showering him with attention while Henry and I sorted through her belongings. I took charge of organizing the smaller items while Henry handled the heavier lifting. 
The process was pretty smooth, and before I knew it, only a few bits and pieces were left for me to arrange. During the unpacking, I placed a fake plant in a spot I thought would brighten up the room. However, Sophia questioned my choice, suggesting a different location. Her tone felt a bit harsh, but I brushed it off, thinking maybe she just had a strong opinion about room aesthetics. I moved to plant without arguing, hoping to keep the peace. Meanwhile, Sophia spent some time with Jack and then turned her attention to the TV leaving me to juggle watching Jack and finishing up the unpacking. Henry was taking a well-deserved break after all the heavy lifting, so I didn't want to disturb him. I wrapped up with a mix of emotions, trying to convince myself that Sophia was just adjusting to her new surroundings, which helped me set aside my growing irritation. However, Sophia's critiques became a daily occurrence. One morning, after getting up early to prepare breakfast for everyone, I decided to take a short break. That's when Sophia commented on the state of the house, urging me to clean instead of resting. Her relentless criticism, combined with her absence during the day and lack of contribution, started to wear me down mentally. I eventually brought up my concerns to Henry, hoping for some support, but his response was disappointing. He suggested I should be more understanding considering the recent loss of his father. His lack of intervention left me feeling helpless and alone. My nights ended with me lying in bed, overwhelmed and on the brink of tears thinking about my situation. On one such night, Jack's cries broke the silence. But my exhaustion made it difficult to get up immediately. That's when Sophia burst into my room, berating me for not tending to my son right away, accusing me of neglecting my responsibilities as a mother. Her words stung, but wanting to avoid further conflict, I silently got up and went to comfort Jack, carrying the weight of the day's tensions with me. That night, sleep evaded me entirely. With Henry having the day off, I mulled over what special dish to prepare for lunch, wanting to make something delightful for everyone. As I was considering my options, Sophia began to get lunch ready. When she laid out the meals, it became apparent that a plate was missing mine. I've prepared food for Henry, who works tirelessly, and my beloved grandson. Naturally, there's nothing for you. You'll have to fend for yourself, she declared. This left me feeling utterly humiliated. It dawned on me then her actions weren't just harsh admonitions. They were deliberate acts of bullying, a realization that hit me hard. I had always tried to see Sophia's behavior as tough love, thinking maybe she was pushing me to be a better partner for Henry. Without this perspective, I felt like I would crumble under the pressure. Unable to retort and feeling increasingly isolated, I poured my heart out to a childhood friend after dropping Jack off at daycare. This is outright bullying. How are you managing to cope? She asked, concern lacing her voice. Sharing the ordeal with her, I found myself breaking down, unable to hold back tears any longer. My friend's support was unwavering. You're stronger than you realize and you'll get through this. Let's think of a plan, she encouraged, giving me a glimmer of hope. Though our conversation was brief, it lifted a weight off my shoulders. Following her advice, I decided to discreetly record the daily goings-on at home. I picked up an affordable recorder on my way back from picking up Jack and set it up in a hidden spot at home. Amidst my cleaning spree, I stumbled upon a piece of paper that had slipped out of one of Sophia's drawers. It was a personal loan agreement with a staggering sum of $20,000. Shocked but realizing its potential significance, I pocketed the document. Later that evening, with Sophia back and Henry returning just in time for dinner, we sat down to the usual setting Sophia's complaints. Out of the blue, she mentioned a discount coupon for a luxurious spa hotel she had received from a friend, clearly hinting she wanted to use it. Henry was instantly supportive of the idea and even Jack seemed thrilled at the prospect. This unexpected turn of events seemed to offer a brief respite from the tension at home, sparking a mix of emotions within me. Truthfully, I wasn't excited at the thought of joining them on the trip, anticipating nothing but discomfort for myself. Yet, surprisingly, Sophia extended an invitation my way, acknowledging my hard work around the house with an offer to tag along. Her unexpected gesture left me stunned, considering her usual behavior towards me. For a moment, I dared to hope her intentions were genuine, not spiteful. That night, I found myself restless, 
weighing the pros and cons of accepting the invitation. Henry approached me with a plea, expressing his desire for me to accompany them. He explained his dilemma. He couldn't rely on his mother to watch Jack, and managing our son alone on the trip would be too challenging. My frustration with how he had overlooked his mother's treatment towards me bubbled to the surface. You've never stood up for me against your mother's unfair treatment. Why should I agree to this? I retorted, leaving Henry at a loss for words. However, he was persistent, leading me to lay down my terms if I were to consider joining them. In a moment of revelation, I showed him the personal loan agreement I had discovered in Sophia's room, revealing her $30,000 debt. Henry was visibly shocked, unable to fathom his mother's financial burden. He proposed that we assist in settling the debt, a request that put me in a difficult position. Given Sophia's behavior towards me, I was initially reluctant to offer any help. Yet, Henry's earnest plea led me to propose my own conditions for any assistance and my participation in the trip. My demands were clear. Henry needed to intervene whenever Sophia mistreated or overly criticized me. Additionally, I insisted on establishing clear rules for Sophia's behavior to be written and displayed throughout the house. If she failed to adhere to these terms, we would have no choice but to ask her to leave. Henry agreed to my terms, and we decided to implement these changes after our return from the trip. To ensure the rules would be in place upon our return, I arranged for my friend to post them around the house in our absence. We agreed to maintain a facade of normalcy until the trip concluded, after which we would confront the situation head-on. With this plan in place, I reluctantly agreed to join the trip, informing Sophia of my decision the following day. Deciding to join them on the trip? I reminded myself to stay patient just a bit longer. On the departure day, as Henry was gathering everyone's luggage, Sophia immediately showed her true colors. Let Olivia handle the bags, she demanded, a clear attempt to belittle me right from the start. Henry gave me a look of apology, but to avoid any conflict, I complied, albeit reluctantly. The bags were heavier than I expected, and managing them while also looking after Jack was no small feat. I silently worried about my dwindling energy reserves, fearing I wouldn't have any left to enjoy our luxurious hotel destination. The journey to the hotel involved a scenic Amtrak ride followed by a drive through mountainous terrain. The hotel itself was a sight to behold, with its stunning exterior and interior exuding luxury. Jack's excitement was palpable as he darted around exploring, while Sophia seemed to appreciate the decor before heading to the front desk for our check-in. As I was about to make my way to our room, Sophia's next words hit me like a ton of bricks. Were you planning to stay with us? I only booked for the five of us. Confusion washed over me as I tried to process what she was saying. The stark realization dawned on me that her invitation was a ruse to exploit me as a makeshift porter, with no real intention of including me in their stay. Then where should I sleep? I inquired, to which she coldly responded, I don't know. I don't care. Maybe you can camp out somewhere around here. Her words were a clear dismissal, suggesting I was to fend for myself outdoors. Her cruelty left me seething with anger, but before I could confront her, she and my family vanished into the hotel, leaving me stranded in the lobby. Feeling utterly defeated, I exited the hotel, overwhelmed by the situation. Henry's feeble apology via message did nothing to console me. By noon, I found myself alone grabbing lunch at a nearby calf and eventually seeking refuge in an open field, hoping to find solace under the night sky. Just as I settled down, my phone rang. It was my friend, checking in on how the trip was going, unaware of the ordeal I was facing. Her voice was a reminder of the plan we had hatched together, a plan that now seemed worlds away from my current predicament. Before the ordeal unfolded, I had the foresight to provide a copy of my house key to my trusted friend, explaining the potential for trouble. After the shocking turn of events at the hotel, I filled her in on the situation. She was livid on my behalf and offered to come rescue me, but I declined. I knew that leaving would only play into Sophia's hands, something I wasn't willing to let happen. The uncertainty of her future actions weighed heavily on me, prompting a call to a lawyer for advice. I shared my evidence of emotional abuse, considering legal action against her. Although the outcome was contingent on proving premeditation, I was reassured by my lawyer that my evidence was substantial enough to pursue a case. 
Exhausted mentally and physically, I found solace lying in the grass under the night sky, letting the cool breeze envelop me as I contemplated my next step. The following morning, I reunited with my family and Sophia just in time for checkout. Sophia's immediate jabs about my presumed night outdoors were halted by Henry's intervention, though she swiftly sidestepped to other topics. It was clear Henry had communicated the extremity of her actions to her. Upon our return home, Sophia's outrage was palpable as she encountered the posted rules around the house. Her anger quickly shifted to shock as Henry presented the loan agreement, her complexion turning from red to pale as her secret was laid bare. Under pressure, she confessed to squandering her late husband's life insurance and accumulating debt thereafter. Henry and I stood firm on the consequences we had discussed. Facing eviction and legal action, Sophia listened to the recorded proof of her behavior, her defiance turning to desperation. She pleaded for mercy, promising to adhere to the new house rules and change her ways. Her earnest apology and willingness to reform took me by surprise. It was a moment of vindication, seeing her so humbled and eager to make amends. Reluctantly, I agreed to give her a chance, under the condition that she truly abide by the rules and curtail her aggressive behavior. Her gratitude was palpable, and for the first time, I felt a glimmer of hope for a more peaceful coexistence. Just when I thought we had turned a corner, my legs gave way, and I collapsed to the floor. Henry quickly helped me into a chair before turning his frustration towards his mother, his voice laden with disappointment and disbelief. It seemed the revelation of the debt had eroded his respect and trust in her. The thought of being sternly reprimanded by her own son was something Sophia had probably never anticipated, and her frantic apologies reflected her shock. After the confrontation, she spent the day in silence, her gaze lost to the sky signaling a seismic shift in the household dynamics. The following morning, I stuck to my routine, getting up early to prepare breakfast. Despite the recent upheaval, Sophia slipped into old habits, throwing a barbed comment my way. However, this time, Henry immediately countered her with a firm reminder of their recent discussion, leaving her speechless and retreating to the sofa. I couldn't help but stifle a chuckle at the scene, but focused back on breakfast. Henry's guilt over not defending me sooner was apparent, and his struggle against the woman who raised him was palpable. Yet, I knew his heart was in the right place, and I couldn't fault him for the complexities of his feelings. His heartfelt apology later on, accompanied by tears, reassured me of his support. Over time, Sophia's demeanor towards me softened. While she still made occasional critiques, the underlying hostility seemed to fade. This newfound peace allowed me to breathe easier, fostering a healthier mental state. To manage the debt repayment of $700 a month, Henry and I teamed up, with me taking on a part-time job to contribute financially. Despite her past actions, Sophia took on the responsibility of Jack's daycare runs commendably, earning back some trust. To prevent any further financial missteps, Henry took control of managing her finances. Our family dynamic evolved gradually inching towards a semblance of harmony. The ordeal taught me a valuable lesson about the complex interplay of love, family, and the challenges of living with a difficult in-law. I had once considered separation as an escape from the harsh criticism and unbearable treatment, but the discovery of the IOU became a catalyst for change, offering a chance to mend fences and strengthen our family unit. Perhaps there was a touch of luck in how things unfolded, but it also underscored the power of resilience and forgiveness in overcoming adversity. Reflecting on everything I've been through, my heart is full of gratitude for my friend's unwavering support. Her listening ear and encouraging words were a beacon of light in my darkest times. Without her, I'm certain the weight of my struggles would have overwhelmed me, possibly leading to a mental breakdown. It's a friendship I vow to treasure deeply. Recalling the hardships fills me with a mix of emotions, tears well up as I acknowledge the effort I've put into keeping my family afloat. Despite battling depression and lacking the drive to handle daily chores, I persevered. Ensuring my family had a decent life, especially striving to shield my son from any hardship, brings a sense of pride and accomplishment that warms my heart. Forgiving Sophia may be beyond my capacity, but she remains my mother-in-law, and I've chosen to treat her with kindness. 
Time has a way of softening the sharpest edges of our conflicts. Since those challenging days, years have passed. My son has blossomed, eagerly stepping into his preschool years. We're on the cusp of paying off the debts and are exploring the possibility of moving to a new home, marking a fresh start for our family. Sophia has gradually begun to assist me, easing the once tense atmosphere in our home. My bond with Henry has grown stronger, enriched by our experiences and mutual understanding. We're even contemplating the joy of welcoming another child into our lives. Our family stands on solid ground now, a testament to resilience, love, and the quiet strength that comes from facing life's trials head on. I'm committed to continuing my efforts, nurturing this stability, and fostering a loving environment for my family. Several years ago, I faced the toughest battle of my life when I was diagnosed with advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. This news was completely unexpected, as I had always lived a healthy lifestyle, complete with regular exercise, a balanced diet, and annual checkups. The oncologist explained that the causes of this type of cancer were not fully understood, and although the prognosis included a slim chance of survival, aggressive chemotherapy could potentially save my life. Determined to fight, I gathered my wife of 18 years, Megan, and our teenage daughter, Kelly, to share the daunting news. Their initial reaction was one of devastation, but I tried to instill hope, promising to do everything in my power to overcome the illness. Despite this, I was deeply concerned about the impact the diagnosis and subsequent treatment would have on our family dynamics. The doctor had cautioned that the side effects of chemotherapy could strain even the strongest relationships, and he noted that many marriages struggle under such stress. That evening, I shared these fears with Megan, who reassured me of her unwavering support through my illness. We were in a stable financial position, thanks to my comprehensive insurance, significant savings, and a trust fund left by my late grandfather. Our home was fully paid off, and I had even secured funds for Kelly's college education, should anything happen to me. Chemotherapy began a week later and proved to be extremely grueling. Each session left me so exhausted and debilitated that it felt as though I had been struck by a freight train. I found myself unable to manage even the simplest tasks, such as feeding myself or taking a shower. Megan and Kelly became my pillars during this time, taking over household duties, driving me to medical appointments, and ensuring I had the necessary medications. They truly stepped up in a time of dire need. For three challenging months, I tried to keep my burdens to myself and help out around the house whenever I felt strong enough. However, I started noticing a change in my wife and daughter's behavior. Their willingness to assist me gradually diminished, and even simple requests like getting a glass of water or some fresh air seemed to irritate them. My daughter began to ignore my requests entirely. The tension peaked one morning when I was running late for an early chemotherapy session. My wife was still upstairs, and when I called to her, she suggested tiredly that I take an Uber because she needed a rest. Shocked by her response, I managed to arrange for both the ride and hospital support on my own. Thankfully, the Uber driver was exceptionally kind and even offered to bring me back home after the session. It was a relief, yet disheartening to depend so heavily on a stranger's kindness. Later that day, after some rest, I gathered the courage to address the growing distance between us. The air was chilly as I confronted my wife and daughter about their recent behavior. I asked them outright if they felt burdened by me. My wife sighed deeply and confessed that they were both feeling overwhelmed. My daughter timidly admitted that my needs during the illness were more than she had anticipated. Realizing we needed a solution, I proposed hiring a nurse for a few days each week to help with daily tasks and accompany me to my chemotherapy appointments. To prepare for days when I might be particularly weak, I also ordered a wheelchair. They both agreed to this plan. I contacted the hospital for recommendations, and they sent a nurse who was both kind and firm. She managed my appointments, ensured I took my medication, and even prepared healthy meals. With her help, my condition improved, which pleased my doctors. Despite these adjustments aimed at reducing their load, my wife and daughter still seemed unhappy. My wife felt increasingly sidelined by the nurse's presence. I suggested that if she felt ready to resume the responsibilities of caring for me, including taking me to my appointments, managing my medication, and ensuring I ate properly, we could consider letting the nurse go. This was the only reason I had suggested hiring help to ease the strain on us all. I brought in a nurse because my condition had become overwhelming for my wife to manage alone, and she reluctantly accepted this temporary solution. She suggested we look for a male nurse, 
but I explained that the hospital's list only included the nurse we had, who was specifically chosen for her expertise with cancer patients and her familiarity with my needs. This nurse was thorough, considerate, and showed great respect towards my family. I made it clear that the only condition under which we would consider replacing the nurse was if my wife and daughter were prepared to take over her duties. My wife was unhappy with this idea and suggested that I should be more self-reliant instead of letting my illness impact everyone else. I tried to explain that there were days when my condition left me too weak to even get out of bed, let alone handle daily tasks on my own. The chemotherapy had severely weakened me. In frustration, my wife stormed off and shut herself upstairs, slamming doors in her wake. I decided to ignore her outburst, knowing that any negativity could only set back my recovery. My primary focus had to stay on regaining my health. Later that evening, my mother-in-law, who lived three states away, called to express her concern about having another woman in her daughter's house, despite the fact that the house was legally mine since I had purchased it before our marriage. I took a diplomatic approach in explaining the situation. I told her that the level of care I needed was more than my wife could handle on her own, and the nurse was here to lessen the strain on everyone. I reassured her that the nurse's stay was only meant to last through the remaining month of my chemotherapy, assuming no complications arose. While she seemed skeptical, she eventually ended the call, which was a relief to me. For about a week after that conversation, life went on fairly normally. My treatment proceeded without incident, and it seemed like we might be able to maintain a semblance of normality, until one eventful day after I returned from a chemotherapy session. When I returned from my latest chemotherapy session, a moving truck parked in front of my house was the first thing I saw. My wife and daughter had packed all their belongings and were preparing to move to my mother-in-law's house. I was deeply hurt and upset, but the sheer exhaustion from the treatment kept me from fully expressing my emotions. The timing of their departure, right after a chemo session when I was most vulnerable, seemed particularly harsh. Seeking some understanding, I turned to my daughter. I asked her if she really wanted to leave, considering she was old enough to decide for herself. Her response was heartbreaking. She told me that she found it too difficult to be around me during my illness and preferred to live with her mother. Watching them drive away, I felt a profound sense of abandonment, which was one of my biggest fears when I started chemotherapy. In the midst of this emotional upheaval, my brother offered his support. He had noticed the nurse spending extra time with me that day and asked if I had any family nearby who could help. Although he lived five hours away and had his own family responsibilities, he didn't hesitate to take some time off work to stay with me. Upon his arrival, he was visibly upset about my wife's actions, calling her selfish and ungrateful. He reminded me that throughout our marriage, I had ensured she never had to work and always had everything she needed. His leave was only for a week, but he proposed another solution. His sister-in-law, Hannah, was in the middle of a difficult divorce and needed a safe place to stay. Hannah was studying radiology on a scholarship at a nearby university, and my house was conveniently closer to her campus than her current residence. We agreed that Hannah could stay with me. It would give her a place to escape the stress of her divorce, and I would have someone around in case of emergencies. I assured my brother that Hannah wouldn't have to worry about rent her company was more than enough compensation. She could pick any of the remaining rooms, I wasn't particular, as my wife and daughter had taken most of our belongings. Hannah moved in on the day my brother had to return home. He helped her settle in, and she was incredibly grateful for the opportunity to stay. She promised to be considerate, keep the place tidy, and help out wherever needed. Hannah was genuinely kind-hearted, and having her around brought a new sense of calm and companionship to the house during a challenging time in my life. I reassured Hannah that she wouldn't need to take on too much responsibility, since I had arranged for my nurse to come in every day of the week, an increase from the previous schedule of four days. After my brother left, I did my best to help Hannah settle into her new surroundings. Over the next few weeks, life found a sort of equilibrium. I missed my wife and daughter deeply, but it seemed I was alone in that sentiment, as they hadn't reached out to me at all. Hannah was incredibly helpful during this period. She took on the grocery shopping, handled most of the cleaning, and even helped prepare meals. She never complained, and her presence was both a comfort and a support. About a month and a half after my family left, I received incredible news. I was cancer-free. I celebrated by ringing the bell at the hospital, a significant milestone. My nurse, curious about my next steps, asked what I planned to do now that I was free from cancer. The answer was clear to me. I decided to file for divorce, seeking to free myself from a marriage that had lacked support during my most challenging times. 
With the divorce proceedings underway, my attention turned to recovery. It was a journey in itself. Gradually, I began to regain my strength, my hair grew back, scars began to heal, and I started gaining weight. I maintained a healthy diet, but allowed myself the occasional indulgence, enjoying the meals I had missed during my treatment. Eight months have passed since I was declared cancer-free, and I feel ready to move forward. I contacted my old job, and they offered to rehire me for remote work. I plan to accept, as I am also considering relocating. Despite my attachment to my current home, it holds too many painful memories. I'm looking for a fresh start in a smaller, quieter place. Unbeknownst to my wife, I intend to give the house to Hannah. She was there for me when I was at my lowest, showing immense kindness despite us being practically strangers. I want her to have the freedom to do with the house as she pleases, including selling it if she chooses. I no longer have any ties to it, especially if it might become a point of contention with my wife or daughter. I found a new place in a tranquil neighborhood in the countryside, and I am truly excited about this new chapter in my life. This is update number one on my journey towards a new beginning. Hello, wife and daughter. It's been more than a year since my initial diagnosis, and I've comfortably settled into my new neighborhood. This community is full of welcoming people, and I've become good friends with several neighbors, including Teresa, who lives across the street. Teresa is a widow whose children live far away, visiting only during holidays like Christmas and her birthday. One evening, Teresa invited me over for drinks on her porch. We shared stories, and she told me about her husband's battle with lung cancer and how life insurance had been a crucial support for her family. During our conversation, I opened up about my situation with you both. Surprisingly, I still haven't heard from either of you, but I've made peace with that. I've been filling my time with new hobbies, especially woodworking, and I'm gradually building up my collection of tools. Today, after coming back from a hardware store, Teresa mentioned that she had seen some people lingering around my house. They didn't do anything suspicious, but they knocked a few times, looked around, and waited in their car for a while. Teresa thought about calling the sheriff but held off, suspecting they might be family. When she described them, I realized she was talking about you too. I'm puzzled about how you found my new address since only my brother and his wife know where I live. Teresa promised that if you returned, she would handle it and advise me not to confront you, given your abandonment during my toughest times. That night, I called my brother, who informed me that you had been causing trouble for Hannah and her roommate at my old house. Thankfully, Hannah had all the necessary documents to prove her ownership, which she had purchased from me. A wise decision on her part. Feeling sorry that Hannah had to endure this because of my family, I called her to apologize. If there's another visit, I hope to resolve the situation permanently. Regarding the divorce, my lawyer sent the documents to your mother's house, but they might have been dismissed as junk mail. At this point, I'm moving on, as our relationship is effectively over. Update number two, you showed up again at my house, but earlier in the day while I was working remotely. When I heard the knock, I immediately turned to my security cameras to confirm my suspicion it was indeed them. My ex-wife appeared unchanged, but Kelly had matured into a young woman. Following the plan Teresa and I had discussed, I stayed indoors, but moved closer to the door to better hear the exchange. Teresa, always the helpful neighbor, approached them to introduce herself. My wife inquired if she knew a man named James who used to live there. Teresa seemed as perplexed as I felt and questioned the phrasing used to. My wife then claimed that her husband referring to me, not as her ex-husband, had lived here before his recent, untimely death after an extended hospital stay. I was astounded by this false narrative, as there was absolutely no record of my death, especially not at the hospital where I received my treatment. My wife further asserted that they were the rightful next of kin, implying ownership of the home. Teresa corrected her by stating that a James did indeed live there, but he was a divorcee. She also mentioned that during our time as neighbors, I had informed her of my wife leaving and my filing for a unilateral divorce. Teresa added that as far as she knew, I had planned to leave all my assets to charity since my only family was my brother. This revelation seemed to puzzle them, and the conversation momentarily lapsed into silence. Teresa then asked if they had a death certificate or a will, to which they admitted they did not. She explained that they would need those documents to claim ownership at the county's record office if they truly believed the property belonged to them. My wife reacted poorly to Teresa's suggestion. She questioned Teresa's authority accusing her of being overly nosy and demanding she mind her own business. It was embarrassing to witness. The neighborhood had been incredibly welcoming to me, and here was my ex-wife causing a scene. 
Despite my urge to intervene and defend Teresa, I stuck to our plan. Teresa, ever gracious, apologized for any misunderstanding and explained she was only trying to help. She then returned to her house, and shortly after, my ex-wife and daughter left. I was relieved they were gone but felt a strong sense of gratitude towards Teresa for handling the situation with such dignity, protecting both my privacy and peace. I made my way over to Teresa's house to apologize for the disturbance. She dismissed it with a wave of her hand, commending that while she found my wife's behavior distasteful, the outburst was somewhat amusing to her. I wished I could see the humor in it too, but knowing my wife's temper, I was concerned about what could happen if she returned. And indeed, she did come back the very next day. I was in my home office, deeply focused with my noise-canceling headphones on, when a loud crash jolted me out of my concentration. I hurried to the living room to discover my front window shattered. Outside, there was chaos, with neighbors trying to calm the situation. It turned out to be my ex-wife. She was the source of the commotion, having smashed the window herself. By the time I stepped outside, two of my elderly neighbors were trying their best to prevent her from doing further damage. Both she and Kelly were wielding bats and had already destroyed some of my potted plants. I caught hold of her arm and bluntly asked if she had lost her mind. Clearly taken aback by my presence likely shocked to see me alive, I firmly told them to leave my property immediately or I would call the police. Unknown to me, my neighbors had already made the call. In her tone, she questioned why I hadn't reached out after recovering. She claimed that she and Kelly would have returned if they knew. I countered that when we married, we had vowed to support each other through sickness and health, a vow she had broken. I had no intention of rekindling our relationship. She was no longer my wife, as I had sent the divorce papers months ago. I reiterated my demand for them to leave. Then, she brought up our daughter, mentioning her upcoming college expenses and her inability to afford the tuition on her own. My response was cold but honest. I reminded her that Kelly had chosen to leave me too. I was prepared to relinquish all my parental rights. They should have considered the consequences of their actions before abandoning me. I wanted nothing to do with either of them. Her sadness quickly turned to anger as she called me selfish and heartless. This confrontation, though harsh, reaffirmed my decision to disconnect from a relationship that had left me isolated when I needed support the most. I couldn't help but find the irony in the situation slightly amusing. My ex-wife, of all people, was calling me selfish. In a moment of anger, I retorted, calling her an entitled jerk and firmly stating that she would not receive another dime from me. Just as I said this, she swung a bat at me, but the timing couldn't have been worse for her, as the police arrived just in that moment. The officers immediately intervened, arresting both her and my daughter. They inquired if I wanted to press charges, and without hesitation I agreed. As my ex and daughter were being led to the police car, they began crying loudly, but their tears did not move me. I had recorded the entire incident, including my wife smashing the window, and had already handed the footage over to the police. After finishing up my work for the day, I ordered a replacement for the broken window and started cleaning up the shattered glass. For the time being, I secured the window with a tarp to keep the elements out. Teresa kindly lent me some buckets to house my plants until I could get new pots. Curious about what drove my ex-wife to such extremes, I did some investigating. It turned out that her mother had passed away four months earlier, and they discovered that the house they were staying in belonged to her husband's cousin, not to them. The cousin had decided to evict them because he planned to sell the property. With nowhere to go following the sale of most of their belongings, my ex-wife and daughter had been living in a motel. Their desperation led them back to our old house, where seeing Hannah led them to wrongly assume I had died. They began snooping around for any possible records of my assets or purchases, which eventually led them to me. Now they faced charges for vandalism, attempted break-in, and attempted assault. Since Kelly is a minor, she is sentenced to community service, but my ex-wife faces jail time for her premeditated actions. I am also considering obtaining a restraining order to ensure my safety and peace of mind. At least for now, I can rest easy knowing I won't have to deal with any further disruptions from her for quite some time.